morning. We are in God's house like we come here every Sunday. And what we do every Sunday to start is we stand up and we worship the Lord in song. So I invite you to stand up. We're going to worship the Lord right now. fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out Good morning and welcome to Pathfinder Church. It's good to see all you here today. We're glad you're here. And whether you have gotten a full night of sleep last night or maybe you missed an hour of sleep, whether you come here feeling good, things are going your way, or whether you come here and you're carrying a heavy burden, in all the circumstances of life, we are called as God's people to say, yes, I will. Yes, in all circumstances of life, I will fix my eyes on Jesus. And yes, I will worship and praise his name. Listen to these words from the book of Hebrews. It says this, Therefore, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
we are here to worship the Lord. We are here for the next hour to fix our eyes on Jesus. We are here to cast our minds to Calvary, to sit at the foot of the cross and to praise the name of the Lord our God. We're going to continue to worship the Lord now. If you're joining us online, we ask that you leave a comment and say hi. Let us know that you're here. Let's worship the Lord together. Let's sing. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body have a seat.
Give it up for a praise band one more time. Weren't they amazing? Thanks, guys. I am here with what you need to know about what's going on over the next few weeks here at the church. Hang on, there's a lot. So here we go. First of all, just a reminder that our Nerf Battle Royale is this coming Saturday. Bring a friend, bring a neighbor, bring a neighbor's kid. I don't know. Don't, don't kidnap them, but bring them. Come play. It's going to be fun for all ages. So even if you don't have your own Nerf Blaster, uh, we can work it out. It's going to be a great time this coming Saturday, 4 to 6. All right, and then just a reminder, next Sunday after this service is our next town hall meeting to discuss the denominational uh, split. There will be a straw vote taken at that meeting, so please plan to stay if you are able, and, uh, and we'll get this moving right along. All right, next up. And then the following Saturday, March 25, we're welcoming Glory Way Gospel Quartet to our building. They're going to put on a, a free concert. There will be a free will offering taken for the quartet, uh, but please come if you are interested in the Glory Way Gospel Quartet concert on the 25th. And then, if you can believe it, we're already into Easter stuff, Holy Week stuff. Woohoo is right. <laughs> so the first thing I want to share with you, we're doing what's called Messiah in the Passover, Saturday, April 1 at 6 p.m. We have invited a rabbi from Chosen People Ministries who is a Messianic Jew. They are uh, the Jews that believe that Christ is our Savior. He is coming to do a demonstration of what a Seder meal is feels like, looks like, what foods are involved in that. Uh, I'm expecting a very fun, uh, hands-on learning experience. Uh, if you're not familiar with Seder meal, that's what Jesus would have celebrated with his disciples in the upper room on what we call Monday Thursday. Uh, so this is, this is a very exciting event. We are asking for RSVPs for this. There's a sign-up out at the desk. Uh, it's also uh, on the website or shortly going to be there, but please make sure that you sign up so that we have enough uh, materials for that event. And then, very next thing is all of the Easter stuff. So Easter is on April 9, if you didn't already know that. We're ha having our two normal services, and then Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday are 7 p.m. services. Uh, you'll hear lots more as we get closer, but wanted to get that out there so that you can be ready. All right, let's move on with our worship service. All right. So this time change, I heard something recently. The time change is not, not to think of it as losing an hour of sleep, but losing an hour of winter. We're one more hour closer, folks, to summer. Hooray! <laughs> And what does summer bring? At least for my family, it brings camping. Yeah, I know there's some other families in the, in the audience who also go camping in the summertime. And it reminded me about one of my favorite snacks. Well, not maybe my favorite, but my kids' favorite. I think I have some of the ingredients we need here. Got some graham crackers, got some marshmallows, and the way I like to make them with a peanut butter cook. So we're gonna make some s'mores. So today, Brother Don is going to be talking about relationships and how we should treat our relationships. So I actually have two bags of graham crackers today. And, you know, huh, this one looks pretty nice and perfect. We'll leave that right there, there. But, you know, these graham crackers, they're, well, already broken, if you can see in my bag. It's already broken. So, you know, they're kind of not perfect, and they um, aren't... Um, smelling very good. They feel like they're probably pretty stale and um, they're not great for um, a snack today. Um, I just, I'm just not sure. They're in this ugly bag. Just, mm, no, they're just not good. They were hard to get in the bag. Yeah, I think they're just, mm, you're just not good graham crackers. Now you graham crackers, you're beautiful. You're perfect. You're amazing. You smell delicious. Your bag closed so nicely. Yeah, you're beautiful. We're going to just set you right here, but you, whatever. So, Brothers Don is going to talk about a 
section of the Bible out of Ephesians. Ephesians 4, 25 says, Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. Don't let sin anger, the sin by, let me try again. And don't uh, sin by letting anger control you. There it is. Oof. Don't let the sun go down on you while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. So take out my anger on the not nice graham crackers. But you are so beautiful. I'm so excited to eat you. <sighs> Which graham crackers make a better s'more? My beautiful ones, right? This is what Jesus tells us about our relationships. Should we treat our relationships like dirt? Crumble them on up, crunch them up? I mean, this might be good for a topping for ice cream or something, but to make a s'more out of, no way, Jose, right? There's not much we can do to repair it. I can't put all the pieces back together. I mean, I don't think I can, but I really wouldn't want to eat a s'more that looks like this. So think about that. When we talk about our relationships with our family members and our friends and our classmates, and we want to build a s'more as a friendship, which kind of graham cracker do you think you should be? Or how should you treat your graham cracker? Crushed up or whole so that they can be a beautiful snack for later? Think about that. And we'll talk more next time. I'm not saying that I'm concerned for Christina, but... She's talking to graham crackers now. Uh, there might be some need of some therapy there, but... <laughs> oh, my. It's always hard to follow her. So you may have paid it attention and be aware of it. Maybe not, but there's a bank out in California called the Silicon Valley Bank, and it's a really, really big bank that has lots and lots of people and lots and lots of businesses that invest their money there. And all of a sudden, with, within the span of less than 48 hours, this powerful, wealthy, top of the feeding chain bank is suddenly whoosh, gone. The investment in that bank suddenly is in question, and um, wow, what are you going to do if all of your money is there? It's concerning. Where can you invest where everything is not only guaranteed to be safe, but to bring dividends, to bring interest, and to bring nothing but good? I choose to continue to believe that God calls us to invest our life in his kingdom, what the things of God are about are eternal, and you cannot lose. So when you give in all the ways that Christians are called to give, which is way more than just pocketbook giving, it's life giving. Those things, they count. They count in the investment to eternity. Would you pray with me as we thank God for the ways in which he calls us to give? Thanks be to you, O God giver of our very life, the breath in our lungs, the pulse of our heart. Thank you, God, for the people that you put around us. Thank you for the circumstances of our life that allow us to be an example of someone that has given their life back to you through Jesus. Thank you, God, for this church and for the ministries that this church makes possible because we covenant together to be in relationship and to give of ourselves and to give collectively. Thank you, God, for the privilege of giving. You bless us in so many ways. We just bring you a heart of gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to worship the Lord in song. I invite you to stand up. Let's turn our hearts to God and worship him.
let's sing. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the have a seat.
oh God, how we need you now. <laughs> and always will and always do. Amen? Welcome, brothers and sisters in Christ, to the house of God this morning. Those of you who are here with us, those of you who are watching online, those of you who will be watching later on in the week, we greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We continue to talk about our Lent sermon series, A Jesus-Shaped Life, and we've been basing it on uh, Steve Cordell's devotional guide for Lent uh, in, of the same title, A Jesus-Shaped Life. And uh, we continue on with that today. Today we want to talk about the relationships of Jesus and, and how he had relationships with other people. So we're going to talk about that this morning. The, the text we're going to do, is, as Christina already alluded to, is from Ephesians chapter 4, uh, starting at the 29th verse and going into the first couple of verses of chapter 5. So let's take a look at this text. And it's not going to be ready, maybe readily obvious to you, um, our sermon topic uh, until I get into it a little bit more. So bear with me, okay? So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. And if you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good work or hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God, be to God in Jesus, indeed. So our theme for this morning is very simple. Three simple words, not so easy to do. Love like Jesus. Love like Jesus, a Jesus-shaped life. So love like Jesus, all right? So keep that in mind as we go through this uh, topic here. I want to I want to talk a little bit, um, kind of by way of side here, just a, just a minute. Uh, our our author, uh, as he opens up this uh, this understanding of relationships with Jesus, he talks about um, the football player J.J. Watt. Anybody know who's J.J. Watt is? Okay, a few of you, not very many. Wow, not a lot of football fans here, or what? Huh? Anyway, J.J. Watt it was a professional football player. I think he just retired this year, as a matter of fact. But J.J. Watt was a professional football player. His brothers, T.J. Watt and Derek Watt, are also professional football players, right? The whole family are professional football players. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, they have a family resemblance in their characteristics. It, Venus and Serena Williams, the tennis stars, right? Both of them were excellent, excellent tennis players and had excellent, exceptional careers. Bobby and Barry Bonds, if you follow baseball, for example, right? Like father, like son. They have these family characteristics or traits that they share. Uh, but we don't limit it to just sports because I'm a big sports nut, so, but maybe you aren't. Maybe you're movie, movie buffs, right? So we could think about some movie families, uh, some actor families. So the Carradine family, for example, uh, it kind of all started with John, the father, John Carradine, who was a relatively famous actor. He's gone on to glory now, but uh, mostly in the horror genre, but, but in many other types of movies as well. His sons, Robert, David, and Keith, have all had or had uh, uh, wonderful acting careers. You might remember David Keith, uh, or David Carradine, who was uh, the guy that played Kung Fu in the original series, if you remember the original series. I'm, I know I'm dating myself. Um, but now some of his grandchildren, like Ever Carradine, she's a, kind of a popular uh, actress these days, are also acting. Uh, if, if you don't know the Carradine family, how about the Barrymore family? 
Have you ever heard of the Barrymore family? It all started four generations ago with William Barrymore uh, at the turn of the last century. Uh, then the more uh, popular versions of the Barrymore family were Lionel, Ethel, and John Barrymore. Today, you might recognize that name Barrymore uh, by the granddaughter of John, who is Drew Barrymore, right? So she's a fourth-generation um, actress in that Barrymore family. So again, uh, family characteristics, if you will, right? I had a very dear friend in South Georgia when I was a pastor down there, very dear friend who was a Methodist pastor. He and I kind of uh, came up through the, the ranks together. And um, he was a pastor. His father was a pastor. His grandfather was a pastor. His great-grandfather was a pastor. All of them in the family and several uncles and aunts and great uncles and aunts were also pastors in the United Methodist Church and, and so, or Methodist Church. And, uh, and so, um, you know, it was a family thing, right? None of this, all these folks that I've been talking, none of this is coincidence, okay? This is family resemblance at its best, okay? Resembling the family. It's shared characteristics of the family. And those shared characteristics can be physical, emotional, and, and even spiritual in nature. Um, when I was about 15 years old, my mother was 30, 31, whatever it was, um, she and I, you would have thought we were twins. We had the exact same haircut, the exact same pair of glasses. Um, we're both very tall. My mother's a very tall woman, too. We looked a lot alike. We shared characteristics, physical characteristics, of looking the same. But, but those characteristics can be emotional, physical, and or spiritual as well. So what's all that got to do with and all these actors and everything, baseball players and everything? What's that got to do with a Jesus-shaped life? Becoming like Jesus means taking on some of his traits and his characteristics, okay? Becoming like Jesus. As we discussed a couple weeks ago, uh, the Bible refers to us as brothers and sisters of Christ. You can find that in Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 28 and 29, I think. So we are to take on some of the family characteristics, okay? And there's one trait, one family trait, one family characteristic that rises above all the others. And that one trait is love. Love is the one trait. Christ-likeness shows up as love. So we ask ourselves, how did Jesus define love toward him? How did he define love towards him? And what he told his disciples the night he gave himself up for us is this. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. You will obey my commandments if you love me. So Jesus says that love, at least towards him, shows up as obedience to his commandments. And, and now we're building on last week's sermon, uh, which where we talked about obedience, right? We talked about that a lot. So what are the three commandments, or what are these commandments, I should say, uh, of which Jesus speaks? What, what commandments does he want us to follow to be obedient to him? Okay. So when Jesus was asked, what are the most important commandments of all, you know, by the teachers of the law, what did Jesus answer with? Well, I think we all know the answer, right? You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second is just like it, what? Love your neighbor as yourself, right? That's how Jesus answered that question. These are the most important commandments of all. So when Jesus says, I want you to obey my commandments, I think he's, you know, he's leaning right here. But then he gives us one more commandment, right? Uh, again, on the night that he gave himself up for us, right? Sitting there with his disciples, his closest followers, he's sitting there with them and he says this to them. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Here's another love commandment, right? Love commandment. And so I want to remind us this morning that all of this, these three commandments that Jesus gives us, are the very basis for our mission statement here at Pathfinder Church. We are Pathfinder. We help people find the way that's kind of our, if you look at our little logo, you know, we've got a little path there. We're helping people find the way. What is the way? What is the path of life? It is this. Path of life equals worship plus connect 
plus serve. And we translate those. Worship means loving God with everything we've got. All right? Connecting together in life groups, small groups, fellowship time, loving one another. And then serving not only within the confines of our church, but outside the church. Serving is loving others. So our mission statement comes directly from Jesus' three laws of or commandments of loving. Love God, love each other, love others. That's what our mission statement is all about for this church. And beloved of God, there is no way to become more like Jesus without growing in love toward God, toward each other, and toward others. We cannot become more like Jesus unless we do these things, unless we're obedient to these commands. And so what does that got to do with relationships? Well, here's what I have to say about that. Jesus started every single relationship he had from the point of love. Every single relationship he ever had started from the point of love. Okay? So I'm going to ask you a question. What comes to mind when you hear the word love? Okay, what comes to mind when we hear the word love? Maybe you're thinking it's those old, warm and fuzzy, ushy, gushy, sentimental feelings about, uh, you know, that certain special someone, okay? Or maybe it's sentiments like, I love baseball, which I do, or I love the movies, or I love pizza, or in my case, I love cookies, Right? Man, those cookies out there were really tempting. I got to tell you. Anyway, right? But that's not at all how the Bible defines love. None of those things. Not the ushy gushy feelings, not the, you know, I love baseball, not the, none of that stuff is how the Bible defines love. Here's how the Bible defines love the biblical understanding of love is acting in the best interest of someone else. Acting in the best interest of someone else. That's love for the Bible. In fact, love, dear friends, is a decision. It's not feelings at all. It's a decision. Some people should recognize that, don't you? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Right? It's a decision. Look at verse uh, 2 of chapter 5 there. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. So what do I mean by when I say love is the decision and it's not feelings? Here's what I mean by that. Jesus made a decision before he ever walked the Via Della Rosa. Jesus made a decision before he ever laid that cross on his shoulders and drug himself to Golgotha. Jesus made a decision before those people started beating on him with whips. Jesus made a decision before they started spitting on him and putting a crown of thorns on his head, before he started bleeding all over the ground. Jesus made a decision. On the night that he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus made the decision that he was going to love no matter what. He was going to love no matter what it meant for him. He was going to offer himself up for you and for me. And I want you to think about this. What were Jesus' words that night in the Garden of Gethsemane? Oh, Lord, if this cup could just pass by me. His human feelings, I don't want anything to do with this, God. From a human standpoint, from his human feelings standpoint, he didn't want to have to go through this because he knew the pain that was coming. He knew the ugliness that was going to be shed upon him. And so his feelings, he wanted to stay away from it if at all possible. And that's what he meant when he said, Lord, if there's any way this cup can pass by me. But then he finished with what? but not my will, your will. He made the decision to go through with it 
trumping over his feelings about what was going to happen that night. If Jesus had relied on his feelings that night, it may very well have been a whole different story, dear friends. He had to make the decision ahead of time to love unconditionally. This is something I share with every couple that I um, am counseling for marriage. That's why Tanya was over here going, yep, I know that one, I've heard that. (laughs) Because I share it every single time with every couple. Feelings can fool us. Feelings are fickle. The Bible tells us this on more than one occasion. I picked a couple that are close to that. Here's the first one, Proverbs 3, 5. You know, trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding, your own understanding or feelings about a situation. You can't depend on your own, at least not all the time. Hosea 10, 2, the hearts of people are fickle. They are guilty and must be punished. Over and over again, the Scriptures tell us don't rely on your own feelings. Don't rely on your own understanding. You've got to rely on what God's Word says. And so we must make a decision ahead of time, friends, before you get married. You have got your, you know, before you're faced with the circumstances that are, that are so, so difficult, you have got to make the decision to love, that's a decision, that person no matter what happens. When they are sick, you know, you get married, and two weeks later, your spouse gets sicker than a dog. You made the decision before that to love that person no matter what. That person is having a really bad week. In fact, they are downright miserable. They're no fun to be around. Guess what? You have to make the decision to be there with them no matter what. No matter what. They're emotionally distraught. I mean, they're beside themselves. You've got to make the decision beforehand to hold on to them and hug them and love on them. Because if you try and make it in the heat of the battle, you try and trust your feelings, you might fall short. Not saying you will, but you might. Think about Jesus and his relationship with Judas, for example. Right? Jesus knew ahead of time, how far in advance, I'm not sure, but Jesus knew ahead of time that Judas was going to betray him. The scriptures are very clear about that. Jesus knew what Judas was going to do. Yet Jesus still decided to wash Judas' feet on that night that he knew Judas was going to betray him. He washed Judas' feet. He made the decision to wash his feet. He invited him to communion. There's some question about whether he actually participated in it or not based on the timing, but he at least was invited, right? Right? And invited to the supper. Jesus even accepted Judas's kiss of betrayal on the Mount of Olives. He even accepted the kiss of betrayal on the Mount of Olives. His decision to do so was out of love for Judas, even though that love may not have been fully returned to him. And he had to make it in advance. If Jesus had relied on his human feelings toward Judas, it may very well have been a different result. Because I'm not sure I could have stood there and took that kiss. Jesus decided to keep Judas in the family core until such time that it came for his betrayal. And then he let him go do what he needed to do. I want you to really think about that, that relationship with Judas. So that's the first thing I want you to hear. Love is a decision. The second thing I want you to hear is that we are a family. We are family. That's your second fill in the blank. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. That's the language that Paul often often uses for family of Christ, body of Christ. The Bible describes believers as family. And the family metaphors abound in the Holy Scriptures. 
we are referred to as brothers and sisters, spiritual fathers. Jesus himself even referred to us as mother and brothers and sisters at one time when he was teaching in a home, right? Uh, Paul, as I said, often refers to us as the body of Christ. We are the family of Christ, the body of Christ. Our text for today is an example, and he does it in many other places as well. Probably I love the most endearing, those of you who were in my class yesterday, you heard this already, but the, the most endearing name for the followers of Christ that I love the most is as his bride. We are, we, the church, are the bride of Christ. How much more endearing can you get than that? Family. We are family. Paul gives us several examples of how family as in the family of God I'm speaking of here, is supposed to treat each other in this text that we just read in Ephesians, right? He starts off with stopping, you know, stop telling lies, but instead tell the truth to one another, right? And here again, we can look at a relationship of Jesus as an example of what we're talking about here. So here's another relationship that Jesus had based out of love to begin with. You remember the story of the rich young ruler, I've shared this with you many times. Matthew 19 is the place. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus wanting to know what he could do to gain the kingdom of God, eternal life. That's what he wants. And Jesus told him you have to obey the commandments dealing with interpersonal relationships. Commands 5 through 10, if you will, of the, of the 10 commandments. Interpersonal relationships, people to people, right? Jesus tells him you've got to obey all those. The young man's like, woohoo! I'm good to go because I've obeyed all those my whole life. See, there was a problem, though. Jesus knew something else about this young man. He knew that the first four commandments, thou shalt love the Lord your God with everything and be the only God in your life, Jesus knew those commandments weren't as important to the young man. Jesus knew that that young man had another God with a small g in his life, and that God was his possessions. He loved his possessions more than he loved God the Father. And so Jesus told him point blank. He was honest with him. He was truthful with him. He told him point blank. He said, listen, son, you got to go sell all that you own, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. Because right now, you've got a different God than God the Father. Jesus told him the truth about himself. The young man didn't want to hear it. And he turned around and he walked away from Jesus. And Jesus let him walk away. He did not go following him, begging him. He let him walk away. So we can also look at who Jesus included in his family because there's some really good stuff here that we need to learn, okay? Look at who Jesus chose to be his closest-knit group of people, his 12 disciples, right? And, And maybe some of the ladies that also traveled along with them. Four fishermen, which, you know, hey, not bad, but fishermen aren't necessarily known for their couth and whatever you know four fishermen a zealot maybe two there's there's hints that perhaps judas was also a zealot but a zealot who whose sole purpose in life as a zealot was he wanted to overthrow the government that was his job he wanted that's what he wanted to do as a zealot a hated tax collector jewish people hated tax collectors because they worked for the Roman government and they took money. Not only did they take the people's money, the taxes, but they skimmed a little off the top for themselves too, right? And a thief were among the people that Jesus were most closely related to. He ate in the leper's home. He hung around with a young lady who had been caught in adultery. All different kinds of people were included in Jesus' family. How did Jesus define family? How did he define family? Right here. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Right? So when Jesus was asked that day in the house, you know, 
your mother and your brothers are outside waiting. They want to talk to you. And Jesus said to the rest of the people that were sitting there inside the room, who are my mother and brother and sisters? Those who do the will of the Father. That's my family. Then Paul goes on in verses 28 through 31 to speak of things in our text that we read this morning, to speak of things that we should not do and contrast them with you know, how we should react within the confines of our family and to others, right? Don't let anger control you. Give it up before the sun goes down. I, I was telling the first service this morning, the only um, advice that Jackie's grandmother gave to us when we were getting married was simply, don't go to bed angry at each other. Work it out before you go to bed. Okay? Very biblical, right there. It's right there. Very biblical. Don't go to bed angry at each other. Okay? Thieves, give up your stealing and go to work for a living. Right? Don't use foul or abusive language, but speak uh, what encourages and lifts up. By the way, um, thievery, guys, isn't just stealing people's possessions. You can steal your employer's time by working personal stuff at your work instead of paying attention to what you're supposed to be doing. You can steal someone's chastity. You can steal a whole lot of things. It's not just possessions. Okay? Don't use foul or abusive language to speak what encourages and lifts up. Get rid of bitterness and rage in your life. Instead, be kind to one another. And then finally, Paul ends with our next point for this morning. Paul finishes with this. Forgive freely. That's your fill in the blank. Forgive. Forgive freely. Verse 32, or verse 32, instead be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Beloved, I'm, I'm here to tell you this morning, here's, here's a little, this is, free, this is a freebie for you this morning. I'm here to tell you that living with each other as human, being, human beings, imperfect people, all of us, means we will get hurt by others from time to time. By those who love us the most. It will happen. I guarantee it. Why? Because we're human. And we're going to falter every now and then. So here's the most loving act of all that we can do. The most loving act of all is to forgive someone who has hurt us because it's completely other-centered. Forgive that person who's hurt you, whoever it is. Remember what Jesus did on the cross. We talked about this last week, hanging there on the cross. He looks down at the very people who hung him on that cross. And then he looks up to heaven and says, Father, forgive them because they just don't know what they're doing. He forgave the very people who were in the midst of killing him. In that moment, our author uh, Steve Cordell, again, the Jesus Shaped Life. If you don't, if you haven't started reading this, there's still some extra copies out there. Pick one up, and, and please read it. It's it's wonderful. Our author Steve Cordell shares a story in the, in this book, in in this devotional, that speaks quite eloquently to this very thought. It's the story about a Chinese house pastor, a Christian Chinese house pastor, who was arrested and beaten for his faith in Jesus. Here's a brief synopsis of the story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you his words so that you hear, hear it from him. This is the Chinese house pastor speaking. I kept seeing my interrogator as a man gone wrong. I felt sorry for his mother. He would be so ashamed of him, or she would be so ashamed of him. I wondered what kind of father he must have had to turn him into such a monster. I felt sad to be in the presence of one of God's creatures that could treat another human so badly with so little concern. Now this, is, this is the pastor writing down his memoirs, writing down his memories of what happened as he was being interrogated and beaten in prison. Then, he goes on, then I would get amazed at myself. Through the pain, I would think, I should be angry, but I'm not. All I want is for this man to be saved. I had three ribs and a wrist broken, two teeth knocked out, my kidneys were malfunctioning, 
And yet all I could wish for was for this man beating me to find Christ and forgiveness. End quote. Wow. I got to tell you, I'm not sure I could have been the same as that Chinese pastor. I hope I would be, but I'm not sure I could be. Would you be the same? The Chinese pastor chose to love no matter his circumstances. This was a decision he had to make in advance. Otherwise, he may not have made it through his ordeal. In the heat of the moment, as he's being beaten and bludgeoned, that's not the time to try and decide whether you're going to love. So what are we to say this morning? What should we do? Here's one thing I think we need to say. In order to love God with our whole heart, soul, and strength, we must choose to love everyone else as well. We cannot hate and claim to love God with everything we have. Are you hearing me? We cannot hate and claim that we love God with, all, with our all because we cannot hate and love God simultaneously. Love is a decision we must make in advance. That's the first thing I want us to think about. Here's the second thing. Remember that we are all related. We are family. And I keep thinking of that old song, is it Sister Sledge? Sister Sledge? We are family. Everybody get up and dance with me or something like that, whatever it was. Anyway, again, I'm showing my age, right? But we're all related. We're family, right? What causes 90% of the problems in our families Perhaps, I mean, maybe I'm, maybe I'm over-exaggerating, I don't know, a little bit, but anger seems to always be a problem for whatever reason. So anger, and, and that's, what, that's what Paul is talking about here, is, you know, don't let your anger make you sin, right? Anger is a source of broken relationships, so deal with your anger promptly. Don't let it linger, don't let it fester into bitterness, and for heaven's sakes, tell each other the truth, like Jesus did to the young man. And the last thing we can say is finally, forgiven people forgive. Forgiven people forgive. A a very smart pastor once said that to me, and I thought, man, that's you can't get any better than that. Forgiven people forgive. Jesus forgave his killers in the act of killing him. Stephen, the very first Christian martyr, asked God to forgive those who were stoning him to death. You can read that in Acts chapter 7, right? Stephen bore a strong family resemblance to Jesus because that's what, exactly what Jesus did as he was hanging on the cross. So did that Chinese pastor being tortured for his faith in Jesus. He, he, he was a strong family resemblance, characteristics, traits, whatever you want to say, of Jesus in that moment by praying for his tormentor and hoping and praying that he could be saved and could come to know Jesus. So we'll finish with Paul's words about imitating God and Jesus. This is our calling for today. Comes from chapter 5, the first two verses again. I'm going to repeat them. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us, and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. He wants your life to be a pleasing aroma to him as you love everyone around you. Love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself, and love each other. It's what we are supposed to be about here at Pathfinder Church. Amen? Amen. Love like Jesus. That's what we're called to do. More on the characteristics of our family next week.
Let's continue on our service now with our praise and prayer time. I have several prayer cards that I would like to share with you. The first one comes from uh, Susie Stewart, Mike and Susie, and from Roxy Mayer, right, uh, from the warming shelter. Uh, many of you last week dropped off blankets. There's more out there now this week already. Uh, thank you so much to those who blessed uh, the unhoused of downtown Kalamazoo. You helped them make it through the night. Love in Christ, Mike, Susie, and Roxy. So thank you for your love towards those folks. That's a praise report. Nikki Bradshaw says, a prayer for healing for Larry. Is it Silsby, Nikki? Am I saying that right, Silsby? Okay, Larry Silsby, who is in the hospital with complications from long-term COVID. Okay, so keep Larry in your prayers, Larry Silsby. Um, from the first service, the prayer card that I got in the first service, this is from Sandy Nevins, but it is about Joyce Wheeler, those of you who know Joyce. Uh, prayers for Joyce Wheeler. She went yesterday morning to Indiana to be nearer to her son uh, to a memory care facility there so she could be cared for. I know that's not what she wanted. <laughs> she wanted to be able to stay here near all of her friends and her church and her family, but um, she needed to be near her son so that he could help care for her. So she's gone down. You can send, according to Sandy, you can send cards to her home for the immediate time being. They'll be forwarded to her. Uh, I don't know how long that will last, but once we get an address for her, then we'll, we'll make sure we pass that on to you as well. All right. Team Green. And, and unfortunately, he's not here. He's downstairs with the kids. Wouldn't you know it? <laughs> Team Green wants to wish Pastor Jake a happy birthday this coming Tuesday. So when y'all see Pastor Jake when he comes back up, he's downstairs with the kids right now. But when you see him, would you please, I was gonna, we were going to sing to him, but he's not here. So we'll, maybe we can sneak it in before we leave. All right. Uh, wish uh, Pastor Jake a happy birthday. Uh, Shannon Mann says, prayers for my sister Teresa as she cares for her mother, uh, Mickey, uh, in her final stages of dementia and kidney failure. So um, Teresa and, of course, Mickey will lift her up in prayer as well. Um, and I have another prayer request. Am I supposed to share this here now? Okay, good. All right. Uh, Carol Long is right over there. Um, is going to have outpatient surgery Wednesday morning, so we want to lift up Carol um, and, um, and uh, pray for God's healing hand and discernment and wisdom for doctors for her surgery. Uh, the last prayer I want to lift up is that I received a text message from Tracy Farnsworth last night, late. I guess it was the previous night, but anyway, uh, finally received some results. Um, Jeff's brother, John, so John Farnsworth, his wife, Sue, um, their home, I guess John was away from home, as if I understand it correctly. John was away from home. Sue was at home along with the family, family pet when there was a large gas leak in the house and the house exploded. The dog was killed instantly. Sue while she has no burns on her body, she has two broken legs, broken arms, and some other things um, that are broken, and some pretty significant damage to her legs, which may cause them to have to amputate both of her legs. So please be in prayer for John Farnsworth and his wife Sue, all right, um, and the fact that they now no longer have a home either, and so they're going to have to get all that situated once Sue is uh, recovering. So let's remember all those folks in our prayers, please. Okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Gracious Heavenly Father, we, we think you're so awesome. Your mercy, your grace that you lavish upon us every day of our lives just overwhelms us sometimes. And Father, we got to confess to you, though, sometimes we just don't understand why things like, like the things that we've, we're talking about here, homes exploding and, and um, Sue being so severely hurt and the loss of a, 
a beautiful family pet and um, the requirements, the needs for surgery, the, the, you know, the long-term COVID, all these things weigh on our hearts sometimes, Lord, and we just don't understand. So, Father, we ask you to, A, be present in every one of those lives that we've lifted up this morning. I also think of Ralph Ramsdale, who is recovering from surgery as well. Um, I think of uh, the Sunder and, and um, Kathy and her husband, John, who just lost his mama. Uh, we lift up all these folks um, to you, uh, to your tender care. Send you our peace and your shalom over them. Uh, lift them up and, and, um, and just give them strength for the days ahead. Um, help them to mourn uh, their losses, but also help them to uh, move forward in their life. We especially lift up Sue to you, Lord, who's in critical condition. We pray that if there's any way for her legs to be saved, that they could be. Um, and we just pray that, um, that, that John can get through uh, all of this um, with your strength. Uh, Father, we also lift up Joyce, and we pray that uh, she will find new friends. Um, she'll find new um, uh, card mates to play cards with and that she will be happy where uh, her new life has, lead, has led her. So, Father, we just ask all these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, and we give you thanks and praise for all that you do for us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Thanks, Don. We're going to close by singing one more song. Let's all stand up and worship the Lord together.
Thanks for being with us here today. Receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. One, two, three.